if you spend all that time building up an Instagram account and it gets hacked, do you still have a business at the end of the day because you've spent all that time putting all of your eggs in one basket? Today on Time We Discuss, I have Ashley Mason with me. Ashley, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Dan. Ashley, you are the founder and marketing strategist for Dash of Social. Looking at your website, the history of Dash of Social starts with writing a blog that you admit was only read by family, which I love. Uh, I'm sure that <laughs> resonates with so many people as they start any type of content creation. So I want to start there. Typically, I like to ask, you know, what's your typical day like? But I don't want to do that right now. I want to start with your blog. How did you take that, you know, what was essentially a personal blog and then elevate that up to a full-blown marketing agency? I started my blog that you mentioned back in 2012. And as you mentioned, Dan, I was spending a ton of time on it, basically treating it as if it was a part-time job just for only my family to read it. But then also I realized I wasn't getting any type of return out of it. And I said to myself, if I'm going to be spending all this time and resources on it, I want to feel like I'm getting something out of it. And so I realized that in order to kind of achieve both goals of monetizing it and reaching the right audience, which at the time was high school and college age girls, would be to use social media to spread brand awareness and build the blog from there. So I went all in on social media marketing and taught myself how to use it from a business standpoint. Because of course, up until that point, I was actually only 15 years old when I started that blog. But up until that point, I had only used social media from a personal standpoint or a personal perspective. So I taught myself how to use it from a business to be able to grow a brand. And things took off from there, especially because Instagram was only about one or two years old at that point. So it was a fairly new platform and there was so much opportunity to be able to grow the blog on there and help get seen in front of new people. So doing so kind of allowed me to become ultimately a micro influencer in that sense, where I was working with companies to review their products, attest press events. They would compensate me simply to write about their companies and so on and so forth. And through my own experience of marketing my own blog, I realized how much I enjoyed marketing. And I also saw how much of an impact it could make on building a brand without really costing that much money. I mean, it really costs your time, but social media to use from an organic standpoint is free. So I realized that these companies that I was working with didn't really have a social media presence, if any at all. And I thought that was a huge missed opportunity for them for being able to reach their ideal customers. And so I wanted to learn more about marketing and also help these companies that I had relationships with. So I offered them pro bono services to dip my toes in the water, but then also kind of thank them for the support they gave me through my blog and give back to them in that capacity. So I, I would work with them to uh, manage influencer relationships, to build their social media profiles, consult on various marketing strategies. And through that pro bono work that I was doing, I kind of had this aha moment where I was like, I really enjoy marketing and want to make this a career one day. And I've always been super entrepreneurial minded since a very young age. So I always knew in the back of my mind that one day I would own a business. I just never really knew what that business would be. But it wasn't until I kind of had that aha moment where I was like, I want to have a career in marketing is when I realized that I want to start a marketing agency. And so through all of the wonderful connections and relationships I built through blogging, it naturally led me into the freelance world where I would just kind of support a few companies here and there until it got to the point where it made more sense to turn that into a full-fledged business and marketing agency known as Dash of Social in September 2016. If I remember correctly, you started the blog, was it, was it 2012 you started it? Yes. Okay. So you started at 2012. And I think you said, were you 16, 15? 15, yeah. 15. Okay. So- 2012, 15 years old, you start a blog. Four years later, at 19, you officially start your business. Exactly. Okay. Now, were you going to college at this point in time? Did you skip college, take a gap year? What did your education look like right at that time when you started your business? I was at the beginning of my sophomore year of college when I started my business. So I had actually started the process of building my business back in my freshman year. The reason why I started my business had a mix of my business goals, but then also a little bit of a personal twist on it. Um, unfortunately, during the winter um, season of my freshman year of college, my mom was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And so this diagnosis that just came out of completely left field 
for someone who is so healthy made me realize that life is super short. We don't have as much time as we think we do to follow our goals. So we might as well pursue the things that we feel passionate about right now. And I had thought for that point that I should follow the stereotypical path that society lays out for us of going to college, getting a degree, building, building a successful 20 plus year career, and then we can go full time um, down the line. I didn't think that I could start a business right then and there. Um, but of course, that personal perspective or that personal situation completely changed my outlook on life. And I said, you know what, I'm going to do this thing right now. So that was January 2016. And I spent the next eight ish months just learning everything I could about building a business and familiarizing myself with the process until I eventually started Dash of Social um, eight years, eight months, excuse me, later back in tw um, 2016. Okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, first, sorry to hear about your mother. I mean, that that's horrible. Um, as I get older, you know, I start to fall into this this bracket where I hear about more and more people are having major health, uh, major health issues, and it kind of chips right. away at you as you get older. So, um, while I don't know you, I don't know your mother. I can still relate to how awful that must have been on so many levels. So, sorry, sorry to hear about that. Um, and taking that and then throwing everything else at you too. You know, you're in school. You're going to school full time. I assume. I, I, yes, I was. I, Okay, so you're in school full time. Your mother has her diagnosis. Trying to get this business up and running. They have all the stuff that goes along with with college as well, the social end, um, the homework, and all that stuff. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so <laughs> did you did you go to school for business or did you go to school for something else? What did that look like for you? Yeah, I went for marketing. So I knew I wanted to go in for marketing. Uh, when I kind of realized in high school that I wanted to pursue it as a career. So I did go for that and major in that. And it was kind of funny because I feel like in my classes, I was learning about the things that I was already making money to do, if that makes sense. Like I remember taking a marketing strategy class and learning how to build a marketing strategy. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm already doing this for my clients and getting paid for it, but now I'm I'm actually paying to learn how to develop a marketing strategy. And so it was just kind of funny to have that double-edged or double-ended experience. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Cause I remember, and I can't think of specifically what this was, but it's nice when you you're teaching yourself something or you're doing something on your own, and then you find out you get that information to you, and it's like, oh, well, you get that reinforcement. I'm doing this the right way. Okay, all right, good. Let's keep on going then. Exactly. So when you were in college, um, did your friends then try to, um, I don't want to say take advantage, but try to um, ask for your assistance with different things they were doing from a social end, or were they two completely different, two, two different worlds? I would say two different worlds. I will say that I sacrificed a lot be, um, going to college and building a business. I was also my mom's like one of her primary caretakers until she passed away before my senior year. So I was juggling the business. I was juggling caretaking. I was juggling school. I was juggling trying to have a social life and taking care of myself. So there was a lot of sacrifice that I had to give in order to be able to get to the point where I am today. So I feel like I didn't have that typical college experience, but I am grateful that I've always had a supportive friend group and a supportive family who every step of the way has always believed in me and making sure that I'm able to achieve what I set out to. I asked the same question. I spoke to um, a gentleman named Zachary. He, he has a, a horse business on the West Coast. I spoke to him a few days ago. And um, one, of the, one of the things that I asked him had to do with getting employees. So I see on your website, there are, I think there's like four other pictures of people, if I remember correctly. So what was that process like for you getting your first employee? How did that unfold for you? It was frightening. <laughs> I was very scared because when you hire someone, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not only responsible for myself, but I'm responsible for this person, making sure that they can continue to have a livelihood and make sure that they have the money they need to support themselves. And so I held off hiring for as long as possible because I had a lot of doubt on whether or not I was successful enough to be able to afford to hire someone in full transparency. But it got to the point where I was about probably two and a half years into my business. I was still in school and it got to the point where I just physically could not put any more on my plate. Like I was maxing out the number of hours that I could work each day, literally awake from 4 a.m. to midnight. And I was like, I just can't add something else. But I knew that if I kind of stopped accepting new clients, that would end up ultimately like plateauing my business. So I said, in order to keep taking on more clients and keep growing this business, I need to bring someone else in. And so what I started to do is I actually did a time audit. 
And I started to track all the things that I was doing within my business. And I would see which places were taking the most amount of time, especially if it was something that was tedious that I didn't necessarily need to do, or if it was something that I didn't enjoy doing, it kind of helped me to think of tasks that I could pass off to this potential team member. And when I realized that I was spending 20 to 30 hours a month doing things that someone else could easily do for me or doing things that I just didn't love doing, I said to myself, imagine what I could do with an extra 20 to 30 hours a month. And so that made me realize that it was time to hire my first team member, who is actually still with us today, which I'm so grateful for. Shout out to Alyssa. But I had actually found her on Reddit, which is totally unexpected for finding team members. I feel like that's not the most common place people would think to look for hiring their first team member or employee. But being able to bring her on and start to delegate some of those projects to her and take those off of my plate was a huge relief and definitely helped us grow instantly because of the fact that I had more capacity now. Wow. Ashley, I'm just, I'm very blown away. You're, you're so, you're so focused. You're so, um, you have it all together. It looks, it's, it's really, <laughs> really cool. Um, and, and you're, you know, you haven't been out of college all that long, which is just amazing. Um, I want to go back further into your past. What was high school like for you, for you as a student? Were you, were you an A student? Were you top of your class? Were you in the middle? Um, I'm trying to find out if this drive is more like intrinsic to you or um, if essentially this is like, no, anyone, I'm just an average person. So what, what was high school like for you? <laughs> what kind of student were you? Yeah, so I, I graduated in the top 10 of my high school. So I was very uh, motivated, have always been very driven. I actually don't have any other entrepreneurs in my immediate family, but both of my parents have always had an extremely hard work ethic and they've always been super hard workers. So I definitely learned from that and have kind of passed on, have been passed on those traits. And so I feel like it's something that's always been carried into me. And I know that they came from hardworking parents and families as well. So it's probably just one of those things that's just been passed down. <laughs> now, what about entrepreneurial support? Do you belong to any organizations locally, um, online? What does that look like for you? I'm a part of this local group because I'm in Massachusetts called Boston Business Women, which I joined, I think, back in 2017. So I've been in it a while. But it's a Facebook group that has, a, I'd say, a minimum of 40,000 women in it. And it also hosts events throughout the state. So that's where I've actually gotten most of my clients is from that group directly. Uh, I'm also a part of a few different chambers, the Cranberry Country Chamber of Commerce and the Marshfield Chamber of Commerce. And I'm also on the board of an organization called So Shore Young Professionals. So it's so nice to be able to be surrounded by like-minded individuals who I can learn from and grow with and build connections with. When I first started doing this um, earlier on in, in the series, um, I spoke to, to Bill Zyders. He's a social media expert, works for a nonprofit organization. And, and we briefly talked about the different social media platforms. And um, one of the things I said to him was that I heard that I don't have any, any data to back this up. It's just one of those things that I heard. So I'm going to throw this at you as well. Um, I, I said that um, what, what I heard was that different platforms, um, the demographics are different. So if you are trying to reach a specific audience, it might be more beneficial for you to really strongly focus on a particular platform. You're exactly right. So Hootsuite and I believe Buffer might do this too. Those are two social media schedulers. Every year they produce a report that shares the demographics of every social media platform. So you'll be able to see the percentage of genders, the age ranges, uh, the education levels, so many different helpful characteristics and demographics that will really guide you to understanding which social media platforms are the best ones for focusing on your business. And within that, it's important to make sure you're focusing only on those platforms because there's no point in being able to build a, build a brand ultimately on a platform where your ideal clients or customers aren't going to find you. So it's really important to hone in on the places where people are active, where they're looking for someone like yourself, and they'll be able to engage with you from there. Earlier in the beginning, you talked about when you first started out, you used social media, um, and I believe you said you were, um, the, the people you were, I'm going to say marketing, for lack of better words, the people you were marketing towards were, uh, I believe, high school or, or college age um, girls, women. Um, is that still like, especially that you, you try to pick industries that you're still focusing on them or, or not so much? That doesn't really matter now for you. We tend to kind of work with two groups of companies. We work with small businesses, so that might be an individual business owner themselves, or they might have a small team. 
And we also work with a handful of tech startups. So it's nice to kind of have that flexibility of a full scale all down from one team member to someone who might have two to 300 employees and just being able to support them with whatever they're looking to achieve with their marketing goals. But I would say a lot of the work that we do is focused primarily towards service-based businesses. So we do a lot of professional services like law firms, um, accountants, financial advisors, gyms, kind of things like that. So it's nice to be able to kind of have our hands in all these different industries. I say that it definitely keeps me on my toes and brings a lot of create, creative freedom. I feel like if I were to go all in on one industry, it would probably, to me at least, feel a little bit monotonous and boring in the same rinse and repeat every day. So it's nice to be involved in so many different projects that give me the opportunity to test new strategies and just be creative in a new way. When you first started, you know, you said that you didn't have any business experience. You basically self-taught and then you reinforced that by going to, to college. Um, if someone is looking to change careers later in life, they're looking to, to start their own marketing firm or, or even social media marketing company or something like that. Um, what, what do you recommend is the best approach for them? It doesn't make sense for them to then, you know, get a master's in marketing, or if they don't have a bachelor's, get a bachelor's in marketing or just utilize other platforms. What do you think is the best approach if they really want to get started and they have the motivation that you have? I personally learn best by doing um, especially with marketing itself, it changes so quickly and the industry is so fast paced that I personally feel like something you might learn in a textbook might not still be relevant or applicable even a year later. And so since it's so quickly changing, I think just being able to actually get your hands dirty and dive right in is something that can be incredibly beneficial, whether you're interning for a company or you're offering pro bono work like I did at the beginning. Both of those options, I think, are really great opportunities to be able to learn more. One thing that I also did that I think helped me educate myself even more was because I never had corporate experience or never worked for another marketing agency, I actually white labeled for a handful of other marketing agencies to help their clients. And so it was really helpful to see how other agencies worked, how they structured their services, how they ran their operations. And it gave me a ton of insight of understanding what I wanted to do in my agency and what I didn't want to do in my agency based on what I saw firsthand. And so ultimately, I would recommend just diving in and getting started because you'll learn, learn the best just by trying things out and going through that trial and error. Let's talk about the, the pro bono work that you did and the white label work that you did. How did you get started with that? With the pro bono work, I had reached out to the companies that I already had partnerships with through my blog. So I saw that there was an opportunity for me to support them and I wanted to just give back and also learn more about marketing. So it really just ended up involved, entailed me reaching out to them and saying, hey, I'm new to marketing and I would love to learn more about it, but I would also like to help you out. How would you feel if I could just try managing your social media profiles for like a three month trial just to help you out? And that was great because they got free support, but I was also able to build my portfolio and my case studies. In terms of the white labeling, I think I found those primarily through LinkedIn and Facebook groups of people posting saying that they were looking for freelancers or looking for contractors to support their clients. And it ended up just kind of turning into a few different opportunities from there. And, but it was really nice because within each agency that I worked with, I think I probably worked with like three to five different agencies. I was actually able to handle probably two to anywhere from two to six clients within each agency. So I wasn't just working on one project. I had my hands in several and it was really helpful to be able to see how all these different companies worked and just get that additional experience. How important are blogs nowadays with all these other ways people can consume information? You know, you have your podcast, you have videos, you have, you know, different forums, you have, um, I can't think of the app at the moment, uh, but there are different ways people can get uh, their information. How important is, is a blog in today's society? So important. So there's a lot of chatter, there has been at least throughout the past year, people thinking that blogging is dead, but I feel like that, that couldn't be less true. I think that blogging is important because one, it's tied to a website that you have full control over. Even though you created your own social media accounts, it's ultimately Meta or LinkedIn or X that has the ultimate control over those accounts. So I think having access to your own website that you can control, that you have the full reins on is crucial. It also helps to drive website traffic in that sense. So if you have a website for your company and then you have a blog as part of that website, anytime you publish a blog post and share it somewhere, it's driving people back to your website. And then they might feel inclined to then poke around, see what services you offer or products you sell, and perhaps take that next step from there. 
And of course, blogging also helps to position you as a thought leader in your industry. You're able to write about a variety of topics that are educational and informative that really help to position you as that expert. So that way, when someone's looking for someone like yourself to hire for a service or they're looking for a product that you happen to sell, you'll be the first person that you think of, that they think of because you've already spent time building that know, like, and trust factor with them through the content that you've written and published. Tangentially related, um, I have very, very strong opinions about, about websites. Um, and I want to throw this at you, this scenario. What do you say to a person who's trying to establish their brand? And um, you, 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 you just say everything you just told me, how important it is to have a blog, the website, you know, reinforcing your brand on the website and bringing people in back to the website. How, if they say to you, they say, well, I already have an app and I'm already using those social platforms and I'm using this blog on this platform. Why do I need a website? Do I really need that? What would you say to them? I would say probably what I shared earlier is the fact that you have full control over your website with social media itself as well. I mean, I've seen so many cases, unfortunately, where people go all in building up their Instagram account and then their Instagram account gets hacked and they no longer have access to the account. So if that's the case, if you spend all that time building up an Instagram account and it gets hacked, do you still have a business at the end of the day because you've spent all of that time putting all of your eggs in one basket? Maybe not. And so I think it's important to follow that advice of not putting all of your eggs in one basket and really diversifying your marketing efforts. So that way, if one happens to fall down or you happen to lose access to one of those channels, you still have the other opportunities and the other channels rolling for you and the train is still able to to chug along ultimately. Let's talk about AI. Um, I was speaking with um, Kyle from Little Guy AI. Um, his episode went live several weeks. It may even be a month or two at this point. Um, but we, he does. He is also a marketing firm um, and he helps small companies. He's very localized, helps small companies um, leverage AI to do some of the marketing for them, to, to write um, to either write blog posts or social media posts, use that as a springboard, and then you know you can edit them as needed or whatever. Is your agency using AI at all to kind of do some of that heavy lifting or not so much? What does that look like for you? What we use AI for is actually idea generation. So all the content that we write is written and produced by us. But I think we've all gotten to the point as creative people where we just hit a writer's block or we're so creatively drained that when we try to think of a new idea, nothing comes to mind. And so being able to turn to something like chat GPT or another AI tool and say, I'm a marketing agency. What are 10 social media topics that I could write about on my social media profiles and have it actually provide ideas to you that you, you can then use, as you mentioned, Dan, as that springboard to then go and write your own social media posts is huge. Now you're saving all that time sitting there at your desk and having nothing come to mind for you. Instead, the AI is brainstorming post ideas and content ideas for you, and it actually aligns with what your target audience would like to learn about. I've said this before on the, on the show several times. I like when I talk to different people and they kind of reinforce different ideas what other people are saying. It's kind of nice to, to hear that. Um, actually, this is the part of the show where I like to um, kind of change things up a little bit. Um, I like to give the person I'm speaking with the opportunity to talk about a cause they believe in, a project they're working on. If you want to talk more about your business, I'd like to hand the floor over to you. I'm actually, in addition to everything I do, I'm a board of trustee member for my local public library. So I will always advocate for libraries and believe that everyone in their community should advocate and support for their libraries as well. So that's first. And then I will also say that for anyone looking for business support, of course, you're always welcome to reach out to me at Dash or Social. But really, my heart lies in being able to support small businesses and give back to our local business economy. So a fun side project that I have that I really just do for fun is I have something called called Massachusetts Business Network that provides free to low cost resources to organizations across the state where we have a blog, podcast, business directory, and monthly webinars where business owners can connect, learn, and grow together. And it's really just a lot of fun to bring people together in that sense. That's awesome. I love the bit about the library. You're not the first person to mention that. So I definitely love that. <laughs> I'm all about helping the, the local economy. That is awesome. Um, I do have a follow-up question for you. Um, can anyone utilize those resources or is it really kind of strictly limited to those in Massachusetts? We have it for people in Massachusetts, but if anyone has any questions, you're always welcome to reach out. I'm always happy to give any advice or share any tips when I can. Ashley, thanks for joining me on Time We Discuss, where we got to talk about what it's like to own a marketing agency. Thank you, Dan. <laughs>